welcome to the Kinky Cast, a sexually explicit podcast for adults. You are listening to a weekly publication, produced every Friday morning. This is our weekly exploration in the kinky world of BDSM and alternative relationships. Today, we present episode 339, Power Exchange and Spirituality, book review with Raven Caldera and Joshua Tenpenny. Don't forget to stop by our webpage for information about this show and others. KinkyCast.com With the coronavirus being active, please practice social distancing. Here's your host, Woody. Thanks, Max, and welcome to another edition of the Kinky Cast. On the line with me is Raven Caldera and Joshua Tenpenny from beautiful Out in the Field, where? Hubbardston, Massachusetts. Middle of nowhere. We're off in the woods. Is that like in the hills there or what? Yeah, we're, we're, we're about a thousand feet up, but we're, we're in a tiny little, little town that's, that nobody ever heard of. It's the town that wasn't there. And we live on an 18 acre homestead in the woods. Swamp. Swamp. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's, it's a wonderful thing and it gives you a lot of peace in order for you to write your books. Yes, it does. It does. It does. Uh, that's why I invited you here today so that we can talk about the depth of books that are somewhere between a how to do it manual and some very esoteric stuff. So uh, there's a whole spectrum there. A lot of our, our new listeners want to know about how do they identify and things like this. You have some books out that, that help them along in that process. Uh, yes. Well, well um, most of our books are either on spirituality or they're on um, power exchange or both. Um, Josh and I are, we've been together for 17 years and we are a master slave owner property couple. So we have a pretty heavy power dynamic. And in, uh, in looking at, um, in, in uh, going out into the various communities and talking to people about power exchange, which we've been doing for over a decade, um, we discovered that a lot of folks, um, a lot of there are people who want to do this to one extent or another, but they don't know how to make it work in real life. They've read a lot of porn. They've read a lot of you know erotica about it, but it's really not realistic. It's what makes people hard or wet. It's not what makes them uh, what what actually will work over the breakfast table. And so what we've tried to do is put out a number of books on how to have a, a negotiated unequal relationship that is that is actually going to work that's actually practical and realistic and is going to work and that has been our goal for uh the the past you know a uh, decade and a half i'd say you used the word unequal relationship unequal relationship yes the idea is is negotiating a power dynamic if that's what you're into if that's what you want to do and by the way, just because you're kinky doesn't mean you have to have a power dynamic or doesn't mean you have to have a power dynamic that's outside the bedroom or doesn't mean you have to have, if you have a power dynamic, you don't have to have one that is all encompassing. It can have whatever limits. It can be only a little bit, a little area, small areas of life. It can be something bigger. Yeah, we'll often use terms like uh, power exchange or unequal relationship to try to cover a broad range of relationships where one person has a certain amount of authority over another person. And um, because a lot of what we talk about in these relationships applies regardless. Um, it's just about how we make that work when one person has given over authority. And um, the specific uh, terms or like, you know, does that count as a master-slave relationship? Um, it, it doesn't really matter uh, so far as it, the, um, uh, the tools for making these relationships work. Mm -hmm. Um, so our, uh, I would say all our power exchange books are available on Alfred Press, which is www.alfredpress.com. Alfred like Batman's butler. And that's a, a, a writer's cooperative that specializes in, as we put it, books for living and loving differently. Going through many of our books, some, pe some of them people will have heard of and some people will not have heard of. Um, our first big power exchange book is called Dear Raven and Joshua, Questions and Answers About Master-Slave Relationships. And this is, this is a big, thick book. It's a giant FAQ. And the reason we wrote that is because um, after several years of answering pe people's questions about power exchange uh, on, online, we realized that we were getting the same same, you know, 100 questions over and over again, and we began to just, you know, 
clip and paste, save them in a file. There's only so many different ways you can answer, how do I convince my wife to dominate me? Yeah, see, that's question number 47, right? Yeah. And so the file kept getting bigger and bigger. And eventually we thought, you know, if, if we clean this up a bit, we can, can make this a, a book. A book. And there it is. And, and that's our, so that's a good beginner book. Um, questions and answers about master slave relationships called Dear Raven and Joshua. And from there, I want to jump ahead to uh, one of the newest books that we just put out, which is called Negotiating Your Power Dynamic Relationship. And this is a book. Uh, it's a it's a it's a fairly thin book because it's it's supposed to be non intimidating and it is all questions. It's all no answers. You supply the answers. It's basically a list of questions for a potential um, uh, dominant or submissive or master or slave uh, uh, who is looking across the table in the restaurant at the potential other half, and you want to know if you are on the same page because uh, with power exchange it's really important that we we really feel that. You need a, a, a higher level of initial compatibility. And also, we see people breaking up all the time online. You know, they, they start something, and six months later, they're online talking about how they broke up because they didn't you know, they, they didn't know that the other person was going to expect this or that. And, and everybody says, well, didn't you talk about that? Well, no, we didn't know we should have. So basically, negotiating your power dynamic relationship is all the questions about all the areas that you should say, are, am I going to give over authority in this area? Is that something that uh, either party wants? Is that okay with both parties? How are we going to do that? And if you, it, and in, really, people talk about what's a good, good red flag to to know that if a, a potential partner uh, is not right for me, and and the unwillingness to sit down and go through questions like this is a good red flag. Just like, oh, never mind, we don't need to talk about that. We can just do it, and not necessarily. So. If you are really new, I would say Dear Raven and Joshua and Negotiating Your Power power Dynamic Relationship are your first two go-tos when you're still in the I want to do this, but I don't know how phase. And then we'll move on to the book that really is Josh's baby. I, I helped write it, but it's really more his. Yeah. And uh, well, I mean, aside from those two books, um, a lot of the stuff starts to get more specific, right? Um, and so uh, I put together a book called Real Service. Real which, Service is the name of it. Which specifically talks about uh, relationships that involve a, a heavy component of service, of, of doing something for this person, not simply being uh, controlled by them in some way, but actually doing some sort of practical things. And, and what does that look like and how do we make that work? What types of things? Um, because often people only focus on the uh, you know, taking care of their leathers. You know, I, there's a lot of uh, uh, submissive men who, when they say, oh, I want to serve you, what they mean is they want to perform oral sex on you, right? Not so, do your taxes or change the oil in your car. Yeah. So so trying to broaden that idea of like, well, what are what what does that look like? If, if this person has you there as a resource to do things for them, what are they going to have you do? And some M types don't know what they might want. They they perhaps say this is their first time. And they're like, well, well, what what could I ask of this person? What could I do with them? And the real service book, it's it's one of our best sellers actually. People love it. Um, the real service book it has a whole section of suggestions for things that uh, S types could do for M types and and that M types could ask of S types and, you know, on different different levels of skill and so forth. So many possibilities here. You also had a book on uh, playing with disabilities. We yes. have four on power exchange and disabilities. Yeah, we have a set, right? Covering um, dominance yeah. and submissives and mental yeah. disabilities and physical disabilities. We, it ended up being a four book series. That's really and important the, because I'm getting a lot of questions uh, from listeners about uh, they may have one disability or another. Uh, some have uh, vision impairments, some have uh, uh, confined to wheelchairs. So there's a lot of different possibilities out there that uh, people need answers for. And I think that one of the things that I really, particularly with the physical disabilities, um, having a romantic relationship where one person have, has a serious physical disability often involves um, a certain amount of a service relationship anyway, right? That more able-bodied person is going to be doing stuff for them. And in a, just a regular romantic relationship, often that can be really awkward and it can, um, uh, uh, or it can be challenging for the relationship. 
yet in a power exchange relationship, in an unequal relationship, uh, whether it's the dominant or the submissive who has the uh, physical disability, it's, um, it gives you a different context for it of like, mm -hmm. you're providing yeah. service for me. You know, it, it's, it really helps with um, uh, some of the weirdness that often comes up in romantic relationships. Now, um, the first one that we, that we did is called Hell on Wheels Disabled Dominance. And the reason that I, I, I started with that one, and the reason that I wrote that was because on some, some list, said so would you serve a dominant who had disability x and 50 percent of the people there said no i need someone who's bigger stronger or can wrestle me down and i was like oh my god you know granted you like what you like your your bits get harder wet over what they get harder wet over but still there's all kinds of things you can do um that doesn't require uh that even if you're disabled so hell on wheels was the first one for physically disabled dominance. And then we followed up with uh, kneeling in spirit, which was is the one for disabled, physically disabled submissives um, who often are like, I can't kneel, so who would want me? And it's like, there's millions of, of ways that you could do good things. For real, we've been to, we were at a conference on disability and there was um, a conference was on power some exchange. Some years ago, oh, sorry, a conference on power exchange. And a panel on, on disability. A, and uh, there was, you know, uh, about a dozen um, women in the audience who um, were submissive women who who seriously thought that the only thing wrong with them is that they had bad knee and they couldn't kneel comfortably. And they thought that this was going to be a deal breaker, it's that, like, that no, no one would want them because of this. No, the right person. These, are, these ended up being anthologies. And obviously, we can't cover every disability because we only could take we only got from people who were willing to write something up for us. So we got as we did as best we could. It's sort of an odd assortment. Yeah. But, but, uh, but the theme is there that you can do it. You can be creative. You can find ways you can figure it out. And then people started saying, well, what about doing something for people with problems with their brains? And so we ended up doing two. Um, the first one was Broken Toys, which is our second bestseller next to Real Service, actually, which is submissives with mental illness or neurological dysfunction or, and neurological dysfunction, which is both, a, you know, both the mental illness issues and, and uh, also neurological stuff like attention deficit disorder or uh, autistic spectrum disorder or things like that. And so and what are the challenges that you face if you've got this, uh, got these problems. And then the fourth one was mastering mind, which is dominance with those problems, with those, those uh, um, brain issues, neurochemistry or neurological issues. And we're very, very proud of this four book series. It's all on Alfred Press because nobody, nobody was talking about it. And, uh, and, and before we put them out, uh, we, would, we would say to organizers, we've got a class on, on disability on power exchange and disability. And are you interested? And they would say, nah, nobody wants to hear about that. And the first organizer that actually let us do it People drove from all over the state to be there. The whole, it was, it held in a big warehouse type room and it, the room was packed. This was about 10 years ago, right? <laughs> yeah. So it really is an important issue. And uh, on that vein, another book that we've got that uh, people might find interesting or useful is a book called Unequal by Design, Counseling Power Dynamic Relationships. This is an anthology that is, uh, it's about power exchange. It's for mental health professionals by mental health professionals. It's co-edited by me and a psychiatrist friend of mine um, who's a, a kinkaware professional. And this is the book that you want to bring to your therapist to explain if you've got about a therapist who's supportive in general and is sort of curious about this idea but doesn't really understand. Like, well, what, what do you mean that one of you is mastery, one of you is slave? Well, that sounds, mm, I don't know, you know. Um, this is the book. It's written in in uh, shrink speak, it's by shrinks for speak for shrinks, and it's written in the shrink speak. Uh, and uh, so, this is the one that you'd want to take to your therapist. Okay, um, so going on, other books people might find interesting. One that has been super popular, and I've had people coming up and saying, "Thank you for writing this book. You saved our relationship." Is called uh, Power Circuits: Polyamory in a Power Dynamic. There are books on polyamory. There are books on power dynamics. So far, this is the only one anyone has bothered to write on both. I have it in the bookcase, and I refer to it regularly. Yes. 
eventually, uh, there are things that I wish I'd put in it. I didn't have people to, enough people to interview. Um, I got a lot of interviews, but there were but the the face of polyamory has changed a lot in the last eight years. So probably another couple of years, I'll probably make a second edition of it. Especially thoughts about hierarchy and power in polyamory, not in the kink community, but uh, in the poly community outside of that. Yeah, but uh, but it, it was a it was a basically we kept seeing people um, breaking up over poly issues. In fact, uh, certainly in the top five. Yeah, in, for power exchange breakups, I would say polyamory is is one of the top five issues people break up over, and especially if they top either three. <laughs> if, if they don't uh, negotiate it properly beforehand, or if they negotiate it and then later one of them changes their mind down the road, uh, it, it's a huge, huge issue. Um, so let's, we wrote that to hopefully prevent some breakups. When you take kink out of poly, you kind of end up with a thing that looks more like vanilla relationships with more people in it. And so naturally they think that everybody is fairly equal. Uh, beyond just that, in uh, uh, a lot of uh, polyamory uh, community, uh, you know, discussions and so forth, they, for how do I put it, they really value egalitarian yeah. relationships beyond the level of sort of a normal romantic relationship, right? There's a strong uh, thing in the poly community about looking at the power dynamics in normal romantic relationships and removing and, them and getting away from that. Yeah. So there is especially there's reasons for that. There's political about it. There's political reasons why the, the sort of general poly demographic um, the, the, especially the politically aware poly demographic, the reason that they are very much a, against anything but egalitarian relationships, um, part of that is because um, they've literally taken surveys and realized that that it makes that polyamory looks better to the rest of the uh, to, to non polyamorous people if it's super egalitarian, and that the inclusion of power makes people very uncomfortable. And secondly, it starts looking like you're forming a cult. Yeah, and, you know? and secondly, it it differentiates them from like. Uh, uh, religious polygamous sects, which they desperately want to be differentiated from, which means that uh, um, people in power exchange sort of come into the poly demographic and say, this is what we're doing. And, and the poly, poly demographic people, freaks out. Poly demographic is like, oh no, that's horrible. That's awful. And so people um, in the, the power exchange, people leave and they don't actually stay long enough to hear the useful things about having multiple relationships that the poly people have figured out over many decades of of uh, bumping into problems and failing. Uh, and so so there's a I tried to write the book as an intersection like look these are these are the useful relationships that regardless of how you organize things you're going to need this stuff. You're going to need these kinds of ways of being. So anyway, that's that one. Another one, another book that we've written is called Building the Team, Cooperative Power Dynamic Relationships. And we wrote this one because we started doing classes. We noticed that there was a lot of adversarial, very punishment-oriented um, uh, uh, relationships, and they would break up. And there wasn't a lot of, of uh, how do we have a hierarchical relationship that isn't adversarial. Now, some people are really into the adversarial, and the, let's have a takedown and a throwdown every five minutes. Um, some people will find that, that that just does not work for them, and but that's what the porn models are, so they don't know how else to do it. So building the team was about the idea that we can be on a team. We can have um, we can have teamwork, we can have cooperation, we can all act like we're adults, and we can talk about this sort of thing reasonably, and we can do this while still ensconced in a power dynamic. We don't have to put that aside to be reasonable adults and, and uh, brainstorm solutions and skip blame and go straight to how can we fix this, what can we do. And it's basically a, uh, an alternative way to run, um, to run a power dynamic relationship that is much more cooperative. Moving on, um, there's the book. This, one we, this was one of our more recent ones, Paradigms of Power, Styles of Master-Slave Relationships. We wrote this because people were, were talking to us and asking, do I have to be leather? Do I have to be Gorean? Do I have to be, you know, uh, Big Little or something like that? Is there a way that to, can I, can I just make my own thing? Is, is one of these the right way to do it? One of these styles, the right way to do it? And, and the others are the wrong way to do it. So we interviewed people, we, we, we had essays from people in all kinds of different styles of power exchange relationships. 
one base, some of them were based on um, military, some of them on leather, some of them on uh, uh, like they they drawn their their um, their inspiration from the past, like 1950 style or Victorian or medieval nobility or ancient Greek and Roman. Some of them were um, age play oriented. Some of them were like CEO, COO um, or ship captain. Some of them were spiritually modeled and, and some of them were very objectifying and some of them just sort of took a whole lot of different things and shoved them together. Like sometimes we're this and sometimes we're that. And the idea for writing this book was first to give inspiration from people who are just starting out and saying, we'd like to, we don't know how we want to model this. What stories do we want to tell each other about what our relationship is? How do we want to get inspiration? Um, yeah, we, we travel all over and talk to people. And often what we see is particularly in um, like outside of big cities, um, uh, uh, you, you get these, um, these groups and there's a couple of, you know, there's one charismatic person who does their relationship in a certain way and people see that and they say, I want to have a relationship like that. And over time, what happens is like everyone in that community is sort of trying to emulate that one person, right? And run their relationships that way. And a lot of folks, it doesn't fit for them, right? That um, uh, uh, they need something else. And, and often they come away from that thinking, you know, maybe I'm not cut out for this. Maybe uh, maybe this sort of relationship isn't for me, and it's because they just don't fit with the um, uh, the role pair that they that they have been exposed to. So we want people to feel free to try a lot of different roles and see what works for them. And we talk a lot about uh, different archetypal roles that people can incorporate if that speaks to them. Uh, like for Josh and myself, one of the one of the sort of one of the ideas we use is like a Renaissance noble and his manservant. Another one might be that we used his superhero sidekick, which is a fun one. Batman and Robin. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Batman and Robin or Frodo and Sam or something like that. There's, there's many, many, uh, many, many different ways that you can, you can pull these, these inspirations in and say, yeah, we're this and we're that. And, and we don't have to be one thing and we don't have to be that thing if it doesn't work for us. Yeah. And I mean, uh, when it comes to uh, figuring out what kind of relationship you're looking for, looking at those sorts of archetypes is is very useful. Right. Um, there was one couple. And who, what you definitely don't want. Yeah. And uh, it can help you work out like what is not fitting in this relationship. There's one couple we talked to where the um, the dominant like like to go out and as he said let his hair down right he liked to go out and party and be crazy and irresponsible before he had to get back to the nine to five grind and he really wanted like a sidekick who would come with him and you know hold my beer bitch right and the woman was not interested in that right she was sort of she wanted more of a protector and felt like oh my god how could I possibly be submissive to this man when he's so irresponsible. And it was just a very bad fit because they were looking, and I think they tried to make it work, but... Their if, ideal of the other person's role was different. Yeah, and talking about those archetypal roles can help figure out, well, what, what does that look like? You can also time segment that into uh, our daily life is going to be model A, but when we play, it's model B, and if we go out in public, it's model C. Correct. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And knowing that you can have more than one and you can, you can, you can set it up that way. Especially when it comes to things like, you know, like, like age play stuff or brattiness or um, uh, high protocol stuff, having a name for that rather than just saying, okay, well, this is how we do MS and everything that isn't like that is not MS, right? Instead say, okay, this is one way that we do MS. Let, let's, let's say, um, you know, we're a uh, mommy boy, um, when we're not dealing with the children, when we are dealing with our actual kids, we, we shift to a different paradigm, but somebody's still in charge. You know, that, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, it, we talked earlier about the real service book that Josh put together on service. The, the follow-up to that was he made uh, the service notebook, which is basically it's a, it's a, a book of fill in, the, fill in everything about, it's all about my dominant. It's about their, uh, you know, all their likes and dislikes and the, and phone numbers and all kinds of things. Yeah, this was um, the sort of, um, maybe this was about 10 years into the relationship. Yeah. Um, this is me 10 years into the relationship thinking, if there was one thing I could give as a gift to me when I started the relationship, what would it be? And, and it was this book. Like, I have a terrible memory for stuff. 
write this stuff down. And so that way you don't have to ask every time, what is it that you always order at Boston chicken? And that's right? when the, the genesis of the book actually yeah, happened. Yeah, the, I, I sent him to Boston chicken. He always get... ordered the same thing and I just did not remember what it was. Right. So having a place where you can keep track of that can very be very helpful, particularly if you're a little more scatterbrained um, early in the relationship. And it's also extremely I didn't anticipate this, but the other use that people um, have found for it is when you're bringing a new person into the relationship um, or particularly if it's um, you have folks who uh, uh, just stay for a little while and they move on. Having all that stuff in writing can help the new person sort of get up to speed without always feeling like that is feeling lost, right? That um, that you have all this information mm -hmm. that I don't understand. About preferences and how we do things. And it's a really good format. It's a, it's a little, um, uh, that one's spiral bound because we wanted it, something that you could just flip through real quick. And it has three different covers. We have the black cover, the all black cover. So you can take it on the bus and or to work and nobody knows what it is. We have the, the sort of dark red cover, which is a little classier. And then when we, for a while, we had a, a, a second boy who had, um, attention deficit disorder and we put we made one with a safety orange cover with the with big black words saying don't lose me on the front of it just for him just for him and people saw that some of the s types saw that we're like oh i want one i want one of those so now we we also have the the orange don't lose me variety um which i think you have to special order but it's there you're very spiritual guys yes we've had long talks in the past on your property, you have, what is it, a vortex? Oh, right, right. Oh, right. oh ley lines and so forth. Yeah, yeah. we have a, a, we have a- I wasn't a, expecting the conversation to turn that We have a, a, a two ley lines crossing and that's where, where we put the labyrinth actually. And we do, we do ritual there. In terms of our spiritual books, that's another topic that I'm so glad to see more people talking about now. Yeah, and uh, there's, we, I've got three of them out so far. Another one of our really, really, real good bestsellers, which is not on Alfred Press, it's on Asphodel Press. Um, Asphodel if Press. If you go to ravencaldera.org, you can find all his books. Yes, ravencaldera.org is my hub website. You click on Raven's books, and you can it'll click you through to every single one of them. But or Amazon. You know. This one is called Dark Moon Rising: Pagan BDSM and the Ordeal Path. And this one I, I wrote quite some time ago. I think it came out in two thousand and six. And I wrote it because people people knew I was the woo woo guy. And people at, at, at like BDSM clubs and circles and conferences would come up to me and say, so we were having a scene. We were doing this, you know, kinky sex and something happened. Something happened. I don't know what it was, but it was something that was big and it like changed us. And what the hell was that spiritual? And, uh, and so I started collecting essays because at the time nobody was talking about that at the time people if, if, on the west coast people were talking about it yeah but, but at the time most people if, if you said spirituality and and kink and bdsm they would say what you mean like rubber nun outfits that's pretty hot right? yeah okay there you go <laughs> no i mean it, it's something different right we're not talking yeah. about that right? and and so looking at pagan bdsm looking at bdsm from a pagan perspective because i am a neo-pagan um and looking at it as the ordeal path, looking at it as something, uh, I, I, I think a lot of Abrahamic religions were at the time mostly just, just uh, wrestling with, is this even okay? But we were sort of beyond that. We were like, so how could we use this as a tool? How can this be a, a tool of enlightenment, a tool of, of making yourself better, of, of, of uh, connecting with the gods, of, of being whatever it is, you know, of, of helping your spirituality with your kink adding adding spirituality to your kink and um so that so dark moon rising has been a very very um popular and powerful book to a lot of people and it actually has spawned um some other folks who have written written other books on 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 uh, spirituality on bdsm and spirituality or ordeal and spirituality which makes me super happy because i don't want to be the only one out there and the other two um, we wrote a book, we, we mentioned Power Exchange in Dark Moon Rising, but we wanted to write an ecumenical book about um, the spirituality of power dynamics, because a lot of us were discovering that living in a power dynamic, if we were spiritual people, we discovered we could use that power dynamic as a, uh, uh, as a spiritual discipline for both parties. And I wanted to write about what that looked like. The name of the book is Sacred Power, Holy Surrender living a spiritual power dynamic and it is a, it's a the first half is written by me and josh the second half is all 
essays. The second half is an anthology of essays by people in different religious traditions who do power exchange and want to talk about how they manage it as a spiritual discipline, including a couple of them who do it without their partner being involved in the spirituality part, although the partner is definitely involved in the power exchange. So that was, that was, uh, that's another one that I'm proud of because it has a lot of different, um, different ways of looking at that and different roadmaps for doing that. And the last one is my most, the, la the, the last uh, spirituality book is my most recent book. It just came out a couple of weeks ago. And it's, it's a really esoteric one. And when I started writing it, Josh was like, oh yeah, 12 people are going to buy that. But one. those 12 people are going to really, really want it. And they'll <laughs> love it. So. And it's called Chains of Stars, The Astrology of Power Dynamics. And this is for people who do astrology and do power exchange, that little teeny uh, cross section there, or people who are interested in astrology and, 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 uh, and are in power exchange and want to know how they can use their astrological charts to have a better, uh, better power dynamic, and it is, a, it has, it's not a, uh, it's not on the level of, um, you know, newspaper sun sign columns. It is a little more. If you don't know anything about astrology, this is. It might be a little more difficult, um, but, uh, uh, but it definitely. But I try to try to guide people through it. A specialist book. Yeah. Yes, it is more of a. Specialist it is more book. of a specialist book. On the other hand, if there are people out there who are interested in the astrology of power exchange, but they really don't want to 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 uh, uh, slog their way through a book, I am, as far as I know, the only astrologer on the planet. Uh, there might be others, but I don't know them. Um, who does uh, astrological analyses for people and for their relationships with power exchange commentary all the way through if they are in power exchange relationships. So that is something that I actually do professionally. Um, and we've also done, just for the, uh, the transgendered folk out there, I, I put together a book called Hermaphrodites, which is the Transgender Spirituality Workbook, which is intersection of trans and spiritual stuff. And I put together a book called Double Edge, which is trans folks doing BDSM. Because uh, I discovered that there's a, a, a sort of higher percentage in the kink demographic of trans people than there is, let's say, on the street or in a, let's say, uh, knitting club or something like that. Um, you know, it's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of trans people in kink for a lot of different reasons, and I interviewed a whole lot of folks about why that is. So those are things that people who are, are trans, because uh, both of us are, are trans, um, the, the people who are trans might want to pick up and look into. You'll notice that I do a lot of stuff that is intersections of this demographic and that demographic. And that's because um, what I write, what, what I try to write, and what I and Josh as my slave is often arm twisted into writing things. Um, what I try to write is the books that weren't there for me when I wanted them. It's like, why the hell wasn't this book here when I was a beginner and I wanted to know about this? Why was it not there? Well, I've got to fix that then. Well, so much thought about so many things, but you do have a new book coming up soon. Yes, um, we it's in the very final. It's in the, it's in the final editing stages, which takes, you know, months, um, but it should be out by this fall. And it's called Mastering the Art of Mastery. And it is for beginning M types, beginning dominance and masters. Uh, anyone who is going to be, who wants to be in a position of some kind of power and or authority over someone else in a relationship, in a close personal relationship, we're not talking about, you know, the boss at work, um, and doesn't necessarily know how to do it. Like, how do I do this and make this work? Um, what we see out there in the, in the power exchange demographics is we see a lot of people who've read a lot of erotica which is often a very poor way to run things. In a lot of erotica, in case you haven't noticed, the dominants are often sociopaths or just like crazy bitches or something like that. They're often not very nice. There's not people. a lot of good role models. There's some good role models for, for S types. There's some problematic role models for the S types. But for the dominant types, there's not a lot of good role models out there. And there's not and, and we, we put out a lot of rules for, for people for submissives who are looking for relationships. Oh, you need to watch out for this and this and this and this. We don't put out a lot of rules or a lot of, of help and, and thought and, and, uh, and tools and tricks and tips and do's and don'ts for people who 
are reasonably ethical, but want to be able to, to do the, the, the dominant side um, in, a, in a, a functional way, in a sustainable way, and not be someone terrible, not be an awful abuser, but maybe they maybe they don't, they don't know how to do this, or maybe that there there are things that they there are uh, um, traps out there that they could fall into that they don't know about that they need warning about. Like this, this can become a problem. So mastering the art of mastery, which hopefully will be out and on Alfred Press by the fall, um, is my gift to all the uh, the beginning would be dominants and masters out there. And this is not like a, you have to run your relationship this way. It's, it's just a bunch no. of advice on how to make these relationships work. Yeah. What and I, how to figure out what you want. What I, what I did was I said, you, you can, you can, if you, for the people who wrote for me, I said, you can give advice about a particular area like leadership or something like that. Or you could write about my biggest boner. This is the biggest mistake I made as a, a, the person in charge of this relationship. And and uh, here's how not to make that. Yes, don't be like me. Don't do this thing. Raven, you and Joshua have been together for quite a number of years now. How many? Yep, 17 years. And we've been um, uh, master and slave for 16. If anybody knows how to do this, I would say that you guys got it worked out. <laughs> well, we know what works for us, right? And We're we not have everybody. enough people who, who have come to us to say, help, our relationship is on fire. So we have a good idea of what sorts of things uh, tend to go badly. Well, right? beyond that, we've also, uh, we've also interviewed a lot of people for these books. Yeah. And one of the things that we learned when we were interviewing people and they were doing things in a way that was not something that would have worked for us, but it worked for them. We've learned not to say, you're doing it wrong. We learned to say, you're doing it differently. Tell us about that so that we can help others for whom this might be a good way to do it. You guys normally are out on the road a lot uh, doing seminars, but uh, in the last six months, that's been curtailed largely. Nope, we've been spending a lot of time at home. We're, we're quarantined because I have a lot of health issues and I'm at high risk for COVID death. So I just don't leave. I'm just here for, for the, so we're not taking clients and we're not uh, in person and we're not traveling and teaching. What we decided to do is uh, we decided to grit our teeth and try, even though we live all the way out here, to try this technology thing. So every other Monday night, we are doing um, some kind of, of, uh, of class online. And for people who are on FetLife, you can find out about that um, through my group, Raven Caldera's own, my FET, FET group, which is my announcement group. And sometimes we do a, an open Q&A about power exchange, just bring us your questions. And sometimes we do um, uh, a class on something, uh, on some, some, uh, and because we don't have to worry about organizers, we're just doing whatever, whatever we feel like, you know, whatever, a, a lot of classes for stuff that organizers wouldn't take or a lot of stuff that isn't talked about. Um, yeah, we're not real thrilled with the doing classes online, but it does mean that, again, yeah, if it's a topic I, that only 12 people are interested in, but those 12 people are really interested. It doesn't matter that one of them's in Bulgaria. You know, you know? and it, I, I miss I miss seeing the people and interacting with the people in real life. I miss that a lot. I really do. Eventually, we'll go back to that. Eventually, we will. We are doing online classes on all kinds of subjects. We just did one on uh, a, one that was really well attended and, and, and on a um, doing power exchange when you have a trauma history, for example. And I think upcoming, we have a and a upcoming uh, at the sort of like bring your power exchange issues and we, uh, we'll send them right there, try to answer them right there. And we're also doing one on healthy objectification later in, uh, in August. So that should be fun. So many possibilities. All of yeah. those uh, links that you mentioned will be available on the kinkycast.com show page. So Wonderful. go check those out uh, along with uh, uh, links to all your books. So there's so many resources here. Anybody that has questions practically about anything in the uh, the DS world, these guys are the experts. Uh, Raven, Joshua, I want to thank you for uh, being with me tonight to uh, to cover this in such depth so fast. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. You have been listening to episode 339 of the Kinky Cast. For more information about this show, go to kinkycast.com views expressed are not representative of the management of the kinky cast we welcome guests with opposing viewpoints 
The Kinky Cast is a production of Rooster in the Round. On behalf of all our Kinky crew, I'm Max.